with that, I, I will turn it over to Dr. Locke. Uh, Kevin, thank you for uh, joining us today and thank you for taking the time to uh, present this information and, and do the research on the front end. We really, really do appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. I think it's important for all of us and all of us here at Winnishik Medical Center. So I wanna review several things. I wanna review the state of COVID right now, particularly with the uh, Delta variant. I wanna review some of the vaccine basics. And I also wanna talk about vaccination decisions. And I'll tell you, because I'm naturally skeptical, I've only included information uh, from really reliable sources. So if we look at COVID now, uh, Delta variant has really changed the game. It's uh, a week ago or two weeks ago is 93% of all infections. It's that or higher now. One of the differences is the viral load with the Delta variant is very, very high. And with that huge amount of virus in the nose, there's several consequences. One is it's much easier to transmit. With the old COVID, uh, one person would infect two to 2.5 people. With the Delta variant, it's somewhere between five to nine people. Because such a large load of virus is inhaled, people are getting sicker faster. It's two to three days now instead of five to seven days. And overall, people are sicker with this virus. Um, vaccinated people can get breakthrough infections. And that's, again, thought to be related to the very large amount of virus they inhale. Uh, and it just overwhelms the immune system. Vaccinated people can also transmit uh, COVID. And in fact, when they look at the viral count in a vaccinated person, whether they have symptoms or not, the number is as high as an unvaccinated sick person. Because of that, the recommendations came out again that we should all mask indoors and masks work if they're worn properly. So we need to make sure we have the proper wet mask and we're wearing it properly. So with all of that, the vaccine still works, especially to prevent uh, severe illness and death. So if we look at infection and hospitalization rates, they're just soaring in America, particularly in areas of uh, low vaccination. So last week, there was record hospitalizations of people aged 18 to 49. Last week, there was 1,800 children that were hospitalized. That's a 500% increase from the month of July. We're now averaging 600 deaths per day. 95% of those are in the unvaccinated. 96% of people that are hospitalized are unvaccinated. So of the 4% vaccinated people that are hospitalized, 40% of those have an immune suppression problem. Their immune system doesn't work quite right. So the vaccine really does work. If we look at natural immunity, which I know some people are really relying on, it turns out it's very clear, it's not as long lasting as the immunity from the vaccine. So people who have had a previous COVID infection have twice the rate of a breakthrough second COVID infection compared to the people that had COVID and then got vaccinated. So I wanna review again, the vaccine basics. Remember our immune system's job is to recognize foreign invaders in our system, gear up, including antibodies to destroy that. And then it has a memory of that foreign invader. So the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines our most common ones are made from mRNA. mRNA is a very common particle. Each cell of our body has thousands of copies of it. Normally, the mRNA is made from your DNA in your body. In the vaccine, it's made in a vat, and then it's injected into you. Once it gets into the cell, it functions as a work order. It goes to the factory inside the cell, gives directions. The factory follows the directions and makes a protein. In this case, it's the spike protein. Now, the spike protein is the bump that's on the coronavirus. The spike protein allows the virus to attach to our cells and infect. So after that spike protein is made and gets into the body, the immune system recognizes it as foreign. It gears up, has an antibody and other immune response, and it destroys it. And now the memory has it set so it's all ready for if you get exposed to coronavirus, then your, uh, your immune system will recognize that spike protein and will destroy the virus. So you don't get the infection or you just get a very mild case. 
mRNA is very fragile. Remember, we had to store it at negative 80 degrees and negative 20 degrees. When you open the bottle, it only lasts for six hours. We're not supposed to shake the bottle before we inject it because it's so fragile. Once it goes through the factory and gives its instructions, it disintegrates in the cell. It does not get into the nucleus where your DNA is. It has no mechanism to affect your DNA, even if it could get there. It doesn't change your DNA. So there's been a lot of concerns about the uh, vaccines as far as safety. So I wanna talk about some of those. So short-term effects from the vaccine, you know, they're very common. They're overall very mild, very short-lived. The original Pfizer information on 37,000 folks, 47% of them had fatigue after the shot, 42% had headaches. But in the same group, the people that got the placebo shot, the rates were 33 and 34% of those side effects. So the rates are fairly low, they're short, even those that had allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, have received second shots. Uh, and the second dose caused either no reaction or in a few people, a real mild reaction. Um, another big concern people have is that the vaccine came very fast. It's so fast, how can it be safe? So in general, when a company wants to make a, um, a vaccine or a drug, it goes through a long process of working on it and testing it. And then it has to go through uh, the regulators to make sure it's safe. Then it goes on to the next step and then goes through regulators. Each step is costly. And if it's not gonna work out, the company stops uh, progressing on that, uh, that product. What happened with the COVID vaccine was that uh, there was huge amounts of government support, both financial and in uh, assisting with the um, regulators. And so the steps were done in parallel. So instead of one step, then one step, then one step, they were all done at the same time. No corners were cut. Every single step was done the way it has always been done. It received the emergency use authorization, the EUA, because the FDA wanted six months of a longer data to make sure things were okay. All of that information now, at least for the Pfizer vaccine, has been submitted, and it's expected uh, to be approved by the FDA in early September. My understanding is the other vaccines are right behind that. So another big concern that I've heard a lot about is the, the fertility concern. And I think that's really important. It's really a big deal. So if you're concerned about getting the vaccine because of fertility problems, you should really understand why there's those fertility concerns. It started with a German politician and physician and a um, ex-Pfizer researcher. He was not very COVID credible. Um, his Twitter account was deleted uh, uh, because of things he was saying. So the vaccine codes for the spike protein. Remember a protein is a series of amino acids put together in various orders and then folded into a certain shape. And that gives each protein its, uh, its unique capabilities. The question is, uh, they noticed that the amino acids in the um, spike protein had about a 7% likeness to the arrangement of the um, uh, amino acids in a certain protein that's located in the placenta. So with that, could the antibody make a mistake and attack that placenta protein leading to fertility issues uh, because it's a 7% crossover? And the answer is no, it can't. That's not very much crossover. That's not very much similarity. And it doesn't account for the unique folding that every protein takes for its unique uh, uh, purposes. So the problem was the fertility concern is always very big. And so it immediately got out a lot of concerns. It's become a medical myth, something that never was true, but always will be. So what they did was they studied it. They took antibodies against the spike protein and took antibodies against COVID and they mixed them with the proteins uh, from this uh, placenta, uh, the specialized uh, uh, placenta protein. And what they found was there was no binding, nothing happened with that. 
We now have data on over 100,000 pregnant women who've been vaccinated. There's no change in the miscarriage rate. There's no change in fertility. There's no change in breastfeeding. It is safe to have the vaccine. The CDC and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology both now recommend that all pregnant women be vaccinated against COVID. Before they said, it's okay to vaccinate. Now they recommend you do it. So with that, remember, the whole reason the fertility issue came up was because of the spike protein. But the spike protein is also on the COVID virus. It's the same protein. So if there is a problem with the vaccine, one can assume there's going to be a problem with the COVID infection, because if you get COVID, you make antibodies uh, to the spike protein. So that's been looked at carefully. There's no change in fertility with COVID virus. But an infected, a COVID infected woman who is pregnant is at high risk of a severe illness. And severe illness means low oxygen, maybe being on a ventilator, maybe even dying. All of those are not healthy for unborn babies. So it just seems like there's more risk of getting COVID if you're pregnant than getting the vaccine. Now, another concern that came up that might be transmitted to other issues, the J&J &J vaccine and the blood clot. So there's an unusual blood clot that people can get, uh, one in the brain, another one in the belly. Um, for perspective, in my 35 years of practice, I've seen one in the brain and one in the belly. So they're fairly uncommon. It does look like with the J&J &J vaccine, there is a slight increase in how often that occurs. It's still very small numbers, very tiny numbers. But what people uh, sometimes don't see is that if you get COVID, the rate of that blood clot in the brain is eight times greater than the rate of the vaccine. And if you get COVID, the rate of that clot in the abdomen is 10 times greater than from the vaccine. So again, we need to put risks into perspective. So to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Um, I think Dr. Goodner uh, very astutely noted months ago that we're not going to be able to just sit back and, and do nothing and just sit this out. We're either going to get COVID or we're going to get vaccinated. And that is even more true now with the Delta variant than it was back when he said it. So there's lots of reasons why people haven't vaccinated. And I think uh, we really have to acknowledge that this is a fearful situation and there are a lot of unknowns. There's also a lot of misunderstandings. So maybe it's helpful to look at vaccination from the viewpoint of risk. And we live with risk every single day. Every time we get in a car, it's, it's a risk. In the, dash, in the disaster world, sometimes it's helpful to look at risk in terms of probability and impact. There's always unknowns, so it's not exact, but it can usually put us in the ballpark. So in my car example, the probability that you or any of you will be in a high-speed car crash today or this week or this month, the probability is very low, very low. But the impact of that is high with disability, with injury, with death. So because of that, you should protect yourself. You should drive safely, you should wear your seatbelt, you should have airbags. If we look at the vaccine with short-term problems, the probability of that it's high. A lot of people do have side effects, but the impact is really low. The side effects, the side effects are, are minimal. They're very self-limited. If we look at vaccine long-term problems, and this has been a sticking point for a lot of people, the probability of a long-term pro uh, problem from this vaccine is very, very low. And of course, we can't predict many years from now what's going to happen but we're eight months into millions upon millions of doses given and nothing has surfaced. And with understanding how the vaccine works, it really makes it, really makes it a very, very low probability that there's uh, any kind of long-term problem. The impact of that potential problem, it's unmeasurable. It could be anything from something very minimal to something that is severe, but it's a very, very low chance it would occur. Conversely, if we look at a COVID infection, the probability of that if you're unvaccinated, it's high. It's very high. You're going to get COVID with the Delta variant. The impact of that would probably be moderate to high. So it's true there's a lot of asymptomatic and a lot of mild cases, 
But even then, the impact is 10 days of isolation. And that's tougher if you can't work from home. You face the risk of uh, being sicker, being hospitalized, being placed on a ventilator, and even death. You face the risk of the long COVID, where people have symptoms of fatigue and headaches and brain fog and other symptoms for many months. It's unknown if something that can give you symptoms for many months can have some permanent sequelae. We're looking at that right now. But as you measure and count up the impact, it's not just you where the impact is. What if you have a prolonged illness or you die? How does that impact your kids? How does that impact your spouse? And it's also not you, just you, when you look at the impact. What if you give COVID to your spouse or to your parent or child or friends or relatives? And what if they have some of those bad sequelae? So the ramifications of the impact are quite large. So as you measure your risk tolerance for our new and unknown uh, virus, you really need to make sure that you, actual, that you accurately measure the known risks of the COVID infection. So in summary, we've reviewed how things have changed with the Delta variant. It's much, much easier to spread. I've reviewed vaccine basics and safety, and clearly the vaccine works. And then we've looked at risks. And when you put it together, the risk of a COVID infection is overwhelmingly more risky than getting the vaccine. So if you or someone close to you is not vaccinated, I would ask you to please honestly ask yourself why. Look at that again. In a situation where there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of fear, a natural reaction of humans is to push back and, and don't do something when you're told to. So I'd ask, are you digging in a little bit? And if you are, in the bigger picture of your health and those around you, is that really the best thing to do? Is that really the right answer for the right reasons? 